what in your life led to this focus on presence and power? And I'd love to just hear a little more about where this came from and what, what deeply inspired you from your life story. I think a lot of things converge. Um, you know, watching my female students in class, you know, and knowing from talking in the office hours that they're smart and they have plenty of, of interesting things to say, you know, and I felt like I needed to give them some tool to help them. I mean, that was really where it started. Uh, but, but for me, for my own life, I really identified with them because I had, you know, I, when I lived here, we had gone up to Missoula to visit friends and tried to drive back overnight uh, to get back for 8 a.m. classes. And in Wyoming, my friend fell asleep and um, rolled the car, and I was thrown out of the car, and uh, spent a lot of time up at Mapleton, um, and woke up there. So I had had a really serious head injury, so I had been withdrawn from college. I actually took four extra years here to finish. I kept trying to start, and I couldn't think. I really could not process information. I was, I, I was failing classes, and I had been told that I would be high-functioning, which is the worst thing to say, <laughs> such an insult, you know, it's such a, it feels like it's very demoralizing, and then I should probably figure out something else to do because it would be unlikely that I would finish college. So I also learned that I had lost 30 IQ points, um, which was devastating to me at the time because I think I had a very simple idea of who I was and being smart was part of that, and I thought the IQ meant more than I think it does now. Uh, Maybe that's just you know rationalization, but you know, I did gain some of the points back eventually. Uh, it's funny there is actually if you, if you Google sometimes I, I've seen like people Google Amy Cuddy current IQ. Like I can tell that people are like, did she get him back or did she not get him back? So anyway, I really felt powerless because I felt like I had lost such a huge part of my identity, and. I just spent years feeling like an imposter and feeling ashamed of this thing that had happened to me. So I didn't tell people that I'd had a head injury. And I, I felt like everything that happened was just incredible luck and I'd better just put my head down or else I was gonna be found out. So I had the worst imposter syndrome. I, like I inhabited the imposter syndrome. It was like mine, I owned that space. And so I, you know, I felt that way all through college. I felt that way all through grad school at Princeton, where I, you know, really it was heightened there. And I got there to, I finally, you know, I get to Harvard, and my advisor had told me in grad school because I was terrified to give speeches. I was just terrified of public speaking. She said, just give every speech that you're ever asked to give. She's like, I don't care if it's to the Boy Scouts. Give the talk because you're gonna feel a little bit better each time. Incrementally, you'll feel a little bit better. And you're not gonna have you know, an overnight, all of a sudden you're a great speaker, but someday you'll look back and go, this isn't scary anymore. You know, I, she said, because you, you know the things you need to know. It's that you're having trouble getting them out because you're so scared. So that's sort of what happened. I eventually ended up at Harvard, which could have been a horrible imposter syndrome experience, but I didn't notice that I wasn't really feeling that way anymore until a student came in and talked to me and said, I can't participate because I'm an imposter and I feel like a fraud and I don't belong here and I was an admissions mistake and all of the things that people say. And she was clearly not an admissions mistake. And I asked her to, uh, to try power posing before class the next day and I said, you need to comment. It was like the 18th of 20 classes and she, she did and she made this amazing comment. She said it was terrifying and she thought she was gonna throw up but she didn't make a great comment, and it got easier and easier after that for her. So all of those things together you know, really got me interested in finding ways to give people more power just to get through these moments. What I didn't think is that these moments would add up. Right? I thought it would be moment after moment, and here's a tool that you can use every time. But what happened was that student, whose name is Katrina, came back to me a couple years later and said, you know what, I kept doing that, and I eventually just became the self that I had in my mind. So it was like I was being blocked from being myself and doing that allowed me to be myself. So it wasn't faking it. It was only tricking myself and actually becoming the person that I wanted to be. So, you know, that, you know, it's a lot of things that happened. I, one other thing I just want to add was that after the head injury, I was a passenger in the car and so I was terrified to be a passenger in a car. And I remember the first time we drove away from the hospital, I know exactly where, where we were and 
uh, I was a passenger, and I immediately pulled my knees up to my chest and wrapped my arms around my knees and put my chin down and made myself into a little fetal ball. And it reminded me of these little insects I played with when I was a kid. Called, I called them pill bugs. They, they roll up. I lived in the middle of nowhere. There were no people. So I'm like, oh, I'll make these things my friend. And so I, I was such a, I thought I would be like a pill bug whisperer. And, and I thought all I wanted them to do was not to do that little curl up thing when I picked them up. So I'd pick them up and they'd do that every time. And I'd feel like, why doesn't it trust me? I was five, by the way. And I realized I'm big and scary. But when I, when I did that in the car that day, I thought, I'm, a, I'm being a pill bug. Now, I didn't unroll. I wish I had, because now looking back, I think if I had changed my body language then, would it have helped me recover faster? And some of the most amazing applications, I think, of body-mind work are in the, the area of trauma. So with combat veterans, for example, uh, where talk therapy is really tough, right, for many reasons. but these. Many times guys come back, they've lost their sort of identity, their sense of pride and power, they feel that their body has betrayed them, and body interventions, getting them to stretch out, to breathe more deeply, are dramatically reducing post-traumatic stress symptoms. So anyway, that was a lot of stuff in there, but it all kind of converged and, and got me in this, this line of thinking. Could you have ever imagined, uh, I don't know how many years ago that was, right? Remember, but, but it was just you, like four years ago. Just <laughs> Ima imagine, imagine, you know, when you were in that moment and Mapleton, imagine that you'd be here this many years later, here I, writ writing a book, a TED yeah. Talk, all yeah. this, you know, able to accomplish all this. Can you imagine? Uh, I mean, not in a million years. Yeah. But you know what? Like, I think that's okay because. I don't think that you can have a goal like that and get there just by imagining it in that way. I really do think yeah. presence is about these moments and getting through the next one and the next one and the next one and, and also being open to the different paths that might open yeah. up to you. But no, I mean, I remember honestly walking into Boulder Bookstore and feeling intimidated, mm -hmm. right? Even by a bookstore, I was like, oh wow, so many smart people in the world. <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't have imagined writing yeah. a book or doing these things. Well, certainly I can think, I mean, when I was reading your book, I was uh, thinking about my field. My, my passion is helping people get to yes. yes. Uh, you know, helping people deal with deep differences, whether it's individuals or organizations or even societies at war. Um, just going off to the Middle East in a few days and actually going for a walk, which is because I, I, I believe that walking, has, as you know, everybody in Boulder, there's, this, there's, there's a power of walking. You just, it just puts you in a different spirit. It's the best way to face fear, really. And, uh, and I also think that walking, you have better conversations. You're, so I, I can instinctively, physiologically feel like yeah. what, what you're saying is, is true. And certainly, uh, I would say for myself, just reflecting back on my, my own experience um, in very challenging situations, uh, that, that the ability to be present is the maybe the hardest thing, but it's it's the the ability to let you know the agenda go. Uh, there's a story that you you quoted uh, in your book that if I I'll just just mention the story just quickly because it was because um, it illustrates this point of what Amy's trying to drive at with presence was uh, I've been working in the country of Venezuela, which as today this was about ten or fifteen years ago and. It was bitterly divided between people who supported the president, who was President Hugo Chavez, and people who opposed him. There were a million people in the streets, pro Chavez, and a million people calling for him to resign. And after about a year and a half, I finally had a meeting with the president. So I thought, great, okay, I've got a meeting, but who's, you know, is he going to pay any attention to me? He doesn't like Yankees. I don't know if he likes professors. Uh, maybe he'll give me 10 minutes. So I'm thinking, you know, what can I say to him? Because, you know, he's got the power to prevent a civil war here. But then when I went for a walk, which was what I do to get inspiration, I thought, you know, I should go in there without an agenda. I shouldn't go in there telling him anything. I should just go in there, just take a risk and use my time just to, just to be present, really, and just see what the opportunity might be there in between the lines and just trust myself and just make that my focus. So I threw out all my notes and 
you know, we get, got into the presidential palace, there were people pounding on the car outside the big demonstrations and waited, and there were lots of people waiting to see the president. And finally, it was ushered in to see him, and, uh, and he sat me down, and, and uh, so I just started listening to him, like you were saying. I just started listening and uh, talked about our daughters the same age, and so on. He started telling me the story of his life and how he got into politics. He'd been a military guy, and, and then an hour went by, and there were all these people waiting outside, an hour went by, and finally he said, so, what do you think of the situation? So then that was a cue, and I was just waiting, and so I said, well, you know, you have an opportunity to prevent a civil war, why don't you, why don't you meet with the opposition, have a dialogue? And he just got triggered by that, he said, you know, those are traitors, they tried to kill me, there was a coup, and so on. And so, right then in the present moment, you know, I was just trying to listen for, okay, where is the opening here? So I, said, so I just thought, well, you mean you don't trust them? He said, yes, that's right, I don't trust them. I said, oh, I understand you don't trust them. And then just an idea came, well, what if you didn't meet with them, but you asked me to meet with both sides to try and figure out what they could do, if there's anything they could do tomorrow morning that would cause you to begin to trust them? Is there any step that they could take? He said, señales, you know, signals, you know, send a signal. I said, yeah, is there any signal they could send? He said, okay, you, how long are you here for? I said, oh, I'm here until tomorrow. He said, well, tonight, here, take my right-hand guy here, he's a minister of interior, and, we'll, and you try and figure out what these señales are. So anyway, that night at midnight, we started, and by seven in the morning, uh, just going back and forth between him and, and the opposition leader, we designed a list of steps that each side could take that would send signals to each other, like don't insult the, don't call the president a monkey. That was one of the things. Uh, don't, uh, you know, those kinds of, you know, they, you know, a lot of it boils down to human basic respect, but by the end of that meeting, even the meeting with him, I realized, you know, two and a half hours had gone by, he had invited me back. Why was that? Because I had abandoned my intention to try to give advice to someone who wasn't wanting to listen to advice, and just tried to be present. So to me, it really illustrates the power of what you talk about in your book. So, so that, that Bill is a, a, an important character in my book. Uh, I, I would have told many Bill Urey stories, but I only had room for one. But the, 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 that section that, that he's referring to is this, I mean, one of the things, let me move back to Julianne Moore for a minute, uh, was one of the things she said is that when I'm present and the other person is present, you elevate everything. You know, one person's presence allows the other, invites the other person to be present because it says, I'm being totally real, um, I'm, I'm listening to you, and you're allowed to be authentic too, you can trust me. So that really got me thinking about, about this idea of presence, uh, liberating others to be present. And one of the other stories I tell in the book is about um, a minister in Boston named Jeffrey Brown, who is, was a young black Baptist minister in the early 90s, and he was dealing with a gang violence issue in massive gang violence spike in, in Boston. And everyone was trying to solve this problem, and many people had good intentions. Many people didn't. Many people just really wanted parts of the city to disappear. But the people with good intentions, what were they doing? They were going in saying, this is what we should do. I've got 10 steps and this is the answer. Or I'm an expert. Or, you know, let's lock down the schools or not let kids out at night. They had all of these answers. And Jeffrey and two of his other young colleagues said that the clergy had gotten together, a group of 300 of them, and they would meet every Tuesday night and talk about this. And they'd have outside speakers come in. And he said, then there was one day when somebody said, now we're gonna break into committees. And he said, Amy, when they say it's time to break into committees, you know it's done. Like, so, so he said one of, one of his colleagues stood up and said, okay, let's have, let's have a street committee. Let's bring in the young people, the youth, that we've never listened to them. Let's hear what they have to say. And, and you know, everybody laughed at this guy and said, okay, fine, you can be in charge of the street committee. But what they did is they formed a group of 14 people. It quick, quickly went and became three. And twice a week, they would walk the streets of these rough areas of Boston from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. because they had to be present on these kids on their turf, right, and on their terms. They started by going to the schools and realized these kids weren't in the schools. Right? They needed to meet them where they were. So the first thing 
was just being present and showing up. So they would just walk the streets, not even interact, just be there. They wore their collars, just walk the streets. And it was a lot of just dancing around where they'd watch each other. But they were, you know, they said they were very scared. I mean, it took a lot of courage to show up and be there. It took power to do that, to be, to feel powerless in a way. Eventually, they gained the trust of these kids because they just kept on coming back and they just listened. They just spent a year listening, saying, "We don't have the, we don't have the, we don't have the answers." They would ask them questions like, "What is it like to, to live this life? You know, what's it like to deal drugs? What's it like to know that your friends are going to die, to be going to funerals? What's it like?" And eventually, they formed a coalition. They started to see these kids not as subjects or as you know, as perpetrators, but as collaborators in this process. But it took an incredible amount of presence to be there and be feel comfortable enough to listen and hear what they had to say. And then those kids became present with them and, and uh, amazing things happened. So uh, presence really allows other people to be present. Yeah, but I, I really like the way you link presence and listening because to me, that's what I, presence allows, when you're present, you can listen to others. But what the kind of the prerequisite, what I think what makes it so difficult for us to listen in this day and age with cell phones going off and texts and tweets and all those things you were showing up on the screen, is that we don't listen to ourselves first. That's right. And to me, a lot of what you're talking about is listening to yourself so that you can then listen to others. That's Being present so with yourself so you can be present with others. That's, and you know, one of the things I talk about, so, and let me just say, the way that I think of presence is as the ability to, um, to sort of know and bring forth your, your best qualities and your knowledge and your skills in these high stress situations. So it's momentary, it's fleeting, it's not gonna last forever, you're not gonna get to a permanent state of presence. But the way that you get to these, these temporary states of presence is to know who you are, right? I talk a lot about authenticity, which is a word that I think gets tossed around like confetti right now without people ever talking about what it means. And let me give you one example of, of how people get there. And I have to refer to a Saturday Night Live sketch that some of you might remember, but some of you clearly I can tell by your age won't remember. It was called Stuart Smalley's Daily Affirmations. Okay, thank you. Do you remember that? I do. So what would he say? He'd look into a mirror and say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And the idea was that it would make him feel better. And then he would interview some famous person like Michael Jordan and try to help Michael Jordan be more confident. Say like, I know it's hard to dribble the ball. Do you ever make sure that it was very, but by the end, because of these affirmations, he would be in what he called a shame spiral saying, I, you know, I'm in a shame spiral and I'm gonna die homeless and penniless and no one will ever lo love me. And the, the, the whole crux of it, what was funny was that we know that when you tell yourself that you're great, when you feel horrible, you're lying to yourself, right? It doesn't work. So self-affirmation in that way doesn't work. So you can't go, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna win an Olympic gold medal in fencing and do it. Of course you can't do that, right? You have to affirm who you actually are. And so what does work, and there are literally hundreds of studies on this, it's called self-affirmation theory, but not Stuart Smalley, is people are asked to generate a list of their core values, and these are the things that they say make you, you. So these are things that w without them you would be a different person. Now list these things, and it's funny because people think that the lists are the same, they're dramatically different. Some people list friends, some people list music, some people list the outdoors or, you know, so you list these things, then you rank them. You take the top one and you write about why that matters to you and then you reflect on a time when you were able to express that value and how it felt. That's it, it is that simple. When people do that, they perform much better in stressful situations like public speaking or math tests it doesn't matter that the self-affirmation was not, I'm good at math. It was, it was about who they are. Even their stress levels, um, hormonally and in self-reports, are, are dramatically lowered. And the reason is because they know that no matter what happens in this stressful situation, they're still gonna be the same person when they come out, right? It's okay if they bomb. But the funny thing is, because they don't focus on it, they end up doing much better. So I think that knowing yourself requires sort of some slowing down and a lot of reflection, and it's a little bit scary. So you do have to be present with yourself, certainly before you can be present with others. That makes a real lot of sense to me because uh, 
oftentimes when you think of self-affirmation, it's, it, it, you're right, it's, it's inauthentic in the sense that there's a big discordance. Of I'm a winner, right? you know. Because it's not reflecting who you are, but, but there is a kind of self-affirmation that is actually a kind of self-discovering of who you are. I mean, you know, in, yeah. in negotiation, I, often people ask me, you know, what's the most important skill in negotiation? And I usually like to say, well, if there's one, it's probably putting yourself in the shoes of the other person, because after all, negotiation is an exercise in influence. You're trying to change someone else's mind. How can you change their mind if you don't know where their mind is? Hence the importance of putting yourself in their shoes or empathy. But now what I realize is actually there's a, there's a prior step, which is putting yourself in your own shoes, uh, which means really, you know, it's that, that really knowing yourself who you are, and I think a lot of what you're talking about is that ability to occupy your space, yeah. occupy your body, occupy your own shoes, know who you are, accept who you are, and if you can do that, then you're open to change, then you're open to influence others. It's so true, and yeah. you and I both have taught at HBS, right. and so, you know, HBS students come across as quite confident, but that doesn't mean they're really confident, right. and we do teach them that you need to perspective take, but I do think we, we had been missing that step of first perspective take with yourself, right. understand who you are. Now that we are starting to teach that, because the evidence is so clear that when people have self-awareness, they do better in every kind of imaginable business situation, like you know, on teams or in leadership roles or in negotiations. So that self-awareness was the step that I think we're missing, and I think we're building that in now. It's true, and you know, it's it's interesting because that's that was that's what I just spent the last four or five years working on, on, on a book that that you know it was thirty years ago that getting the yes came out, but it was like I suddenly realized that that actually the most important person we have to get to yes with is ourselves. Uh, that we are actually the most difficult ap opponent that we ever face. We get in our own way, but we can also be our biggest ally if we can do this kind of work. And a lot of it is really, it's, it's, it's about being present. It's, it's uh, I mean, the, the, so I, I was just in Cambodia, as I mentioned, and I, I was really moved by so many people that I met. I mean, it's, it's a, 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 you know, it's such a, um, just a moving experience to be there because it's a place that's simultaneously sort of haunted and hopeful. Um, everyone there was touched by the Khmer Rouge, everyone. You know, mm -hmm. everyone lost someone, they were hurt, perhaps they were part of it, it, it everyone. But it, it's, it's the, there's this sort of fertile, fer, fertile soil that's been turned over, I think, in recent years, where Cambodia's figuring out how, who are we now, what are we gonna, how are we gonna represent ourselves to the world? And I, I, um, I had an opportunity sort of on the side to meet with young women who were trying to become leaders. And these women were like between 18 and 22. And the, the one who organized it had worked in a garment factory from the time she was six had been abused at the garment factory by her boss and just decided she was going to become a leader. She had no formal power, she had no resources, but she somehow found that power in herself, that kind of self-awareness. And so I, I just think there are so many stories like this of finding that personal power, but for her, when you talk to her, she does not act like someone who feels that she doesn't deserve to be there. It was figuring out that she deserved to do that. But even though everyone was telling her she didn't, somehow she knew that she did. So I think that sort of occupying yourself, taking up the space that you deserve. And I know we're so afraid of people having too much power, but I actually think it's powerlessness that corrupts. It's, it's personal powerlessness. You know, it's sort of, it, this is going to seem light, but it's, you know, people ask me sometimes, what's your biggest challenge? And I have plenty, but one of them is, you know, not listening to trolls on the internet. And, you know, the higher your profile becomes, the more the trolls come out and the nastier they become. And, you know, I don't look at, I don't look for that stuff, but sometimes it just comes your way in your Twitter feed and you can't ignore it. And I find it really, really difficult, partly because I'm so optimistic about people. I'm like, what's, what, there's a mean person, what happened? <laughs> but also, you know, um, I'm letting them sort of define who I am, and instead of going, no, 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 I know who I am. But the, the thing, the, the funniest thing about it is that I realize that that's, they are coming from a place of total personal powerlessness. They are sitting at home alone, 
feeling so passed over, so resentful, so personally powerless, that the only way they can get a sense of power is to poke, 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 and get a reaction. So I think that powerlessness can really corrupt, because um, it causes us to act like scared animals, which means we either attack or we completely withdraw. And I think we have time maybe for one last question. Yeah, no, I was, uh, so, um, let's see, what would be one last? So, if you think about uh, one thing, uh, you talked at the end about girls and women in particular, and I mean, if I think about present, for example, I mean, my, some of my greatest teachers actually are my, my wife, Isan, and my daughter, Gabby. Uh, they, they've been <laughs> pretty enormous busy. teachers to me of, of presence. What, what advice would you have for, for, I mean, for, for young, young girls and young women today in yeah. terms of, uh, of how they can overcome both the obstacles that you mentioned at the end there of the biases in society? Wow, I mean, I, I, I wish that I had an easy answer to this. Yeah. I mean, because the exposure is so pervasive, it, that has to change. And so I don't, uh, I think that we need to make a lot of big changes. Um, I definitely think starting early is good, right? So encouraging them to run free. You know, somebody asked me recently, what happens when girls become women? You know, what, what changes? And I said they stop doing cartwheels. That's what happens. Like, we need to keep doing cartwheels. Um, maybe not. Really, but sort of figuratively, we we do need to do that. Uh, I I think that um, allowing girls. I, I think that what happens is that we they they we girls have this idea that being powerful is masculine, right? Power is associated with masculinity, and I just think that we need to very clearly encourage them from the beginning when they speak up in class, when they come home and say, "Hey, I did this thing, and I felt really proud." That's the stuff that we need to be sort of encouraging and saying, that's really brave of you to take a chance. And I think that this is just even a broader lesson. I, I feel like as I do this work and meet other people who are writing in the same genre, what I find is that the people who most inspire me are not, I used to think of them as fearless. They're no one is fearless, right? They're, so first, for and this is true for everyone. Everyone's fearful at some time, and that's okay. These people are not fearful. I mean, they're not fearless, they're brave, right? They're, 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 they are fearful, but they're pushing through that fear. And so I think those are the moments when your child pushes through a little bit of that fear, they are the huge victories, right? It doesn't, it's not about the score on the math test. It's about pushing through a little bit of that fear. And maybe that's in a social situation. I mean, I think a lot of times it's in a social situation. Um, so yeah, I think encouraging that, uh, I wish I had more answers sure. to that question. That's such a hard one. Yeah. I think it's getting better. I think just to be mindful of this. I mean, the body is t constantly, the way that you carry your body shapes the way you carry out your life, you know? And, and I think that we need to teach our kids that same lesson, boys and girls. I really want to thank you really for the, all the gifts you brought out you. since your days here in Boulder. And uh, it's, just, it's wonderful to have you thank back you. in Boulder. And we hope you'll come back to Boulder many times. So, I will definitely will. Um, and really, good luck in inspiring the world with your thank book you. about presence, because I think presence is really what the world needs most. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here.